Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison, a Community Engagement Manager for the DIA. Thank you for joining us in celebration of Women's History Month. We'll be discussing women of substance, women in the art of the DIA with our trained docents, Kathleen McBroom and Deb Coombs. Christine Mark, our manager of volunteer development, is here to take your questions throughout the program. To ask a question, log into your YouTube account using your Gmail, or just leave a public comment on this Facebook post. Now to get us started, let's welcome Kathleen and Deb. Hey ladies, how are you? Hi Amanda, how are you doing? Amanda, it is so great to be here today, and I'd like to welcome everybody to Thursdays at the Museum. We are indeed going to be continuing our celebration of March is Women's Month, Women's History Month. And for those of us, those of you who were with us last week, uh, you may remember that we did a special show on an exhibition that we have down at the museum right now. It's called By Her Hand, Artemisia Gentilici and Italian Women Artists of the Renaissance, 1500 to 1800. Well, we're going to continue today in a little different vein. As Amanda said, today we're going to be looking at women in the art of the museum. Women who, when you walk by, you stop and you say, who is that woman? Why is she so compelling? I want to know more about her. And we're going to be skipping all over as we look at some really unique images. So I really hope you enjoy the show today. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to my good friend and colleague, Deb Coombs. So Deb, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Hi, Kathleen. And I want to say top of the day to you. It's not morning anymore, but you are Irish. I salute you, top of the day to everybody and hello friends. Well, let's get started with this, this uh, talk on women of substance. And we're gonna start with this wonderful portrait of Princess Sophia, Princess Palatine. It is an oil on oak panel, and it was painted by the Dutch artist, Gerrit van Hanthorst. It's not located on the third floor of the Dutch uh, galleries uh, in the museum. At the time this portrait was painted, Sophia, who was born in 1630, was only 11 years old. And Kathleen, just as you said, sometimes we walk by and we look at these paintings and we know nothing about these people. And that's happened to me many times when I toured on the third floor in the Dutch galleries. She's always caught my eye. And I wanted to know, what was it about her that she's in this museum? Is it her heritage or because she's so beautiful? And was it about the skill of the artist? who painted her image? Or was it because her son eventually became king of Great Britain? So what is her story? Well, Sophia was the 12th child of Frederick, King of Bohemia, and Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James I, King of England. She was born in The Hague and grew up in the Dutch Republic where her family had sought refuge after they were sequestered during the Thirty Years' War. Sophia's father, Frederick, died when she was only two years old. This is a state portrait. Sophia's mother, Elizabeth, commissioned many state portraits of her children in order to marry them off as strategically as possible. In order to fulfill so many commissions, the artist, Hanthorst, developed a studio practice. He had pupils and collaborators who helped him. And as a result, that studio was able to produce a large number of portraits and replicas, and Elizabeth became his most important patron. Hanthorst and his studio represented Sophia, this young girl, six times, and our portrait has at least three known copies. While certain of Elizabeth's children did secure politically advantageous marriages, none of them proved more important than Sophia's. Take a look at this young red-haired beauty who's dressed in considerable finery and she's wearing a lavish display of pearls. Pearls were the symbol of chastity and purity. Not only does she wear a pearl 
belt and choker, but her dress and her hairpiece are studded with pearls. See the enormous pearls that dangle from the ruby gemstones on her headdress, her bodice, and her belt. And look at those colorful plumes that come off of her headpiece and fall just behind her hair. Sophia was a very educated young woman. She was a gifted linguist, a witty writer, and was raised in the vigorous Protestant life of the Dutch Republic. Despite these attributes, and despite her great beauty, Sophia did not marry until she was 28. But in 1658, she did marry. She married Ernst the August. He was the first elector of Hanover. As a married woman, she remained very intelligent and she was always curious. She was well-read and was a patroness of the arts and of philosophers. Together with her husband, she greatly improved the Herrenhauser Palace and Gardens where they lived in the German Duchy of Hanover. She bore her husband seven children who all survived into adulthood. And in 1714, Sophia's son George would become king of Great Britain. So how did this happen? Well, now for a little history. Bear with me, everybody. Beginning in 1603 and for over 100 years, seven monarchs from the House of Stuart ruled England. All of them were Protestant, except for one, James II. He was a Catholic. England was a Protestant nation and tolerance for his religion did not extend to the parliament who refused to pass his measures. Now, King James had two daughters, Mary and Anne, and they were both raised as Protestants. So only three years after he took over the throne, he was deposed. And who deposed him? His daughter, Mary, and her husband, William. So now, William and Mary became king and queen of England. Sadly, though, their marriage did not produce any children. So Mary died just five years later and William ruled alone. In order to guarantee Protestant succession, which was so very important to the country, their nephew, young Prince William, and the only child of Mary's sister Anne was named next in line to inherit the throne. But in 1700, the state of affairs in England suddenly became very bleak. Poor Prince William was only 11 years old, but he died from pneumonia. And now there was nobody to inherit the throne. Anne had 17 children. All of them had died in infancy and childhood, except for William, and he dies at 11 years old. <coughs> then King William was ill and he fell and died for, and fell off a horse and he died. So Anne was crowned queen. Now the British Parliament was really desperate. They absolutely did not want the throne to revert to a Catholic, but after Anne, who would continue the line? Sophia was a Protestant and the granddaughter of King James I. And although there were some 50 Catholics who had stronger claims to, by blood to the throne, Parliament passed the Act of Settlement and named Sophia and her heirs the next in succession in the Protestant line to the Imperial Crown of England and Ireland. So Sophia was going to be the next queen after Anne. But this law passed in 1701. Sophia was only already 71 years old. She's older than Anne by 35 years, but Anne was plagued by ill health throughout her whole life and in her 30s, she grew increasingly ill and obese. Sophia enjoyed much better health, even though she was some 35 years older. And she wanted to be re ready to move to London so that she could assume the government in the case of Anne's death. So she wrote to us, uh, Anne, in 1714 and asked her permission to make the journey to England to study the parliament and get to know the country. On June 5th, 1714, Anne sent her a furious reply, saying that she was mortally offended, that she did not want a rival court in her kingdom, and that Sophia and her son could not come to London, only until she was dead. 
After receiving this very disturbing letter, Sophia fell ill. Now, by this time, she's already in her 80s. Three days later, on June 8th, Sophia collapsed in her gardens in Hanover and died. She was 83 years old. But Anne dismissed her death as shipping porridge, meaning of no consequence to her. But just two months later, Anne suffered a stroke. Huh. On August 1st, at 7.30 in the morning, Queen Anne, the last reigning monarch from the House of Stuart, died at the age of 49. At 2 p.m. on that same day, Sophia's son was proclaimed George I, King of Great Britain and Ireland, and the first British monarch from the House of Hanover. And the House of Hanover would have six ruling monarchs in succession. The last would be Queen Victoria. And as an aside, just for your information, some of you may have seen or heard of this wonderful movie called The Favorite. It just came out in 2018 and it starred Olivia Coleman, who played Anne. And it focused on Anne and her court and her illness. And it also talked much about her mercurial temper. She, she Because she was sick, you know, she, her moods went up and down. She was not the nicest person. But that's it. So here is this wonderful portrait of Sophia. Christine, are there any questions? Uh, actually, we don't. But boy, did did uh, those two ladies live colorful lives, Deb. And you know what they say. Every picture tells a story. Mm -hmm. And when you see this 11-year-old girl, you think, what is, you know, what's up with her? Why is she here? Well, then you learn about her story. I will never look at her the same again. That's right. I yeah, I, I, I've always been um, captivated too in the Dutch galleries. You know, when I peek over at that wall and there she is, it's just, it's such a stunning portrait, but her life was just incredibly. What a story. Yeah. Yeah. And she, sure. was beloved, and she was beloved at home. I mean, she, she, she was beloved by the people too, but that's what happened. Yeah. All right, are we ready to move on? Now, if we, if that, that's, that painting of Sophia is up on the third floor of the Dutch galleries, but if you go down to the second floor, right outside of Rivera Court in the hall is this stunning sculpture. And it's called Black Moorish Woman. And it's by a, the, the greatest, one of the greatest French sculptures of the 19th century. His name was Charles. Henri Joseph Cordier. Cordier was born in 1827 and he trained in Paris and established an international reputation for himself through his arresting portrayals of people from different ethnicities. He debuted his work at the Paris Salon when he was only 21 years old with a plaster bust of Saeed Abdallah of the Darfur people the same year that slavery was abolished in all French colonies. In 1851, that sculpture of Said Abdallah, it was reproduced in bronze. And you know who bought it? Queen Victoria at the Great Exhibition in London. That same year, he was appointed ethnographic sculptor to the National Museum of Natural History. And he held that position for 15 years, going on a number of government-sponsored missions first to Algeria, then to Greece, and then to Egypt. Cordier was inspired by the Orientalist movement that was popular in art. Although he did depict many Europeans from France and beyond, he was opposed to the largely Eurocentric artistic viewpoint that prevailed in his day. Now, here's a quote from him. He said this, Beauty does not belong to a single privileged race. Beauty is everywhere. Every race has its own beauty, which differs from that of others. The most beautiful black person is not the one who looks most like us. In 1856, Cordier was granted a fund of 1,000 francs by the museum to, vi to visit Algeria in order to study the various types of indigenous peoples from the standpoint of art. 
And when he, he took up that sojourn with great enthusiasm, and he said, when I get there, I'm going to stay in the Casbah. I'm not going to stay with other French expats. I want to be among the people. And he was welcome at, there and got along very well. The women of, of Algeria held an immense fascination for many French artists because their lives were so inaccessible to men, particularly to foreigners. So how was he able to portray this woman? He was able to pour, portray her so perfectly because he knew her. She was his neighbor in the Casbah during his year long stay there. He was able to exchange signs with her through the narrow window of the side door and he was quickly able to pose her. They did not speak, but they did communicate with sign language. And the artist wrote passionately of her mysterious allure by saying this quote, her, yes. her, 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 her unique beauty is the product of a wonderful mixture of Moorish and Negro blood. The perfect regularity of her features, her intelligent forehead, and her magnetic eyes all attract the object of her desires. So this particular bust combines innovative techniques, luxurious materials to convey a very natural appearance. This bust is made of bronze, but let's see what he does to give all the details in the polychrome to this piece. Okay, now let's take a look at the next slide. <clears throat> take a look at her face and her hair. Again, he used this electrolytic process to silver plate the whole bust. And then on the exposed skin and her hair, he used a, chemically, a chemical process to oxidize it, to give it this dark color. And then it's an ebony pat patina. And then he enriched that ebony uh, patina with a coat of lacquer to give it this gleam, this shine, this depth. Now take a look at the right slide on the right. Look at the silver blouse. There's a flower pattern on it. He used a metal work technique called chasing. And what you do with that is you take various small little tools and he literally raised and indented with his hands and those tools, the silver surface, and that gave it a, a flower appearance. So there, he's depressing and he's raising the surface to give her that pattern. And now let's look at the next slide. Take a look at her, the silver, the silver uh, headpiece that she has on, the flowers, and then look at the gold. Look at the gilding that gives life to her earrings, to her straps and her waist. Look at that scarf along her waist. It's striped with a deep green patina, and that was uh, attained through a whole different chemical process. Last, on her left arm, Cordier signs this piece. Take a look at that. It's, it's inscribed with the words Algier, 1856, Charles Cordier. He became very famous. And by the way, he made this when he was only 30 years old. And he became very famous for his effective use of color, his different colored marbles, and extensive use of silvering and enameling. The work that Cordier produced from this and other travels constitute an insightful gallery of the diverse people and cultures beyond European borders. And he died in Algiers in 1905 at the age of 78. Christine, do you have any questions? We have a few comments about how wonderful this piece is and it's absolutely stunning. And you know what? These pieces and the rest of them too that we're gonna talk about, they stop you in your tracks. It, it's amazing how beautiful they are. Yes, and as, as uh, terrific as these um, images are, they still don't match how she looks in person. Yeah, they don't do, they don't do uh, justice to it, but, but it's great that we have them and that we can yes. come up close and talk about them. Yes, no, these images are really beautiful. Um, and as is, um, as is the model. I love her earrings. They, you know, you can actually remove them. They're, they're, she has pierced ears. 
really that's interesting yeah <laughs> yeah if you notice they're looped through her yeah you could see their look yeah huh they were made separately well you know what when i look at her i think that this was an act of love by him not not necessarily for her as an individual mm -hmm. just his love of people of, from everywhere and he wanted to portray them so wonderfully Right, and the Algerian people, because he, he did uh, end up uh, loving Algeria so much that he really spent most of his life there, didn't That's he? That's right, and he died there, yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> if there's no other questions, let's move on. And again, if you're in the museum, I'm going to take you downstairs to the first floor, and we're going to go into prints and drawings and take a look at this piece called Mademoiselle Marcel Lender. And it's by the artist who you all have heard of, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Toulouse-Lautrec was uh, born from an aristocratic family, but he spent his adult life among the common people of Montmartre and its cafes, dance halls, and the theater were the subjects of his art. He was both, both a keen spectator and an active participant. He designed posters, theaters, theater programs, scenery, and costumes for a number of stage productions. And although he was drawn to the spectacle of the performance, it was the performers themselves that most fascinated him. Marcel Lender was a French singer, dancer, and entertainer. Born Anne-Marie Marcel Bastien, she, became, she began dancing at the age of 16 and made a name for herself performing at the Theater de Variety in Paris. Lautrec first encountered her in 1893, <clears throat> the year he began to attend the theater on a regular basis, but it wasn't until two years later that he became totally infatuated with her. In 1895, Lunder was asked to star in Shield Creek. That was a comic opera. She had the starring role and she played Princess Galeswin, who in the second act, dances this sensational bolero while playing castanets. Her costume included a headdress with two giant red poppies worn like plumes that accentuated her flaming red hair. When Lautrec saw this beautiful woman dance in all her glory, he was totally enthralled. During the operetta's three-month run, Lautrec is said to have attended the show at least 20 times to watch her dance the bolero. He would always sit in the front row and would arrive late, but just in time to see Lender dance her bolero in the second act. He loved the way she would dance with her back to the audience. When asked about his devotion to the play, he said, no, 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 I don't care about the play. I only come to see Lender's back. Look carefully, you won't see anything as wonderful her back is sumptuous. However, <clears throat> it's interesting that only one of the lithographs that resulted from this burst of theater going depicts Lender from behind. <laughs> he sketched and studied that artist so diligently and produced several, maybe from six to 11 lithographs, inspired by her appearance in Chilperique. And he also produced two paintings, one of which boosted her popularity considerably after it appeared in a Paris magazine. And now that painting is at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. But our piece right here, Mademoiselle Marcel Lender, is a lithograph printed in color on cream wove paper. It measures 14 by 11 inches, and it was purchased for the DIA by the Graphic Arts Council in 2007. In this work, Lautrec portrays Lunder in mid-performance. Her mouth is open in song as she leans toward her audience. She's wearing the same costume that she wears in her performance. She was the only performer whose features Lautrec did not caricature. And <clears throat> he did not simplify her or distort them. Although he was very candid in drawing her double chin that was caught in the bright lights of the foot, uh, the bright illumination of the footlights. He evoked her vivacity by, by, uh, with a multitude of wiry, wiggly lines. The focus on Lender's head and shoulders points to the, to the influence 
of 19th century Japanese woodblock portraits of famous kabuki performers that had been recently imported into France. This technically difficult lithograph required eight different stones, one for each exquisite color, and exemplifies his mastery over the medium. Take a look at the upper left. You can see it very faintly. It's signed with the artist monogram device. The next slide, please. <clears throat> there she is. But what is ironic is that Marcel Linder loathed to lose Lautrec. His beautiful and famous homage to this woman was totally unappreciated by his subject. And to quote her, she said this, what a horrible man. He is very fond of me, but as for the portrait, you can have it. How sad. Marcel Lunder died in 1926 at the age of 64. Christine, are there any questions? No, I think everybody is stunned by this one. I haven't had one question. <laughs> no, she she was a real beauty. Look at her waist. Look at how skinny she was. Oh, yeah, she that corset. Yeah, someone yeah. pulled her corset awfully tight. But he didn't care. I don't even think he cared about her face. I think he just cared about her back. I, but, you know, toulouse Lautrec, he had his own uh, quirks. So good for them. <laughs> Deb, Deb, I think my upper arm is larger than that woman's waist. Oh, yeah. Mine too, for sure. Yeah. Mine for sure. She was very pretty. Beautiful, beautiful lady. Yeah. Well, Kathleen, now you have some wonderful photos for us, correct? I do, Deb. Thank you. Deb, you've been giving us quite a history lesson today. Oh, yeah. And um, you, you've been talking about pieces that are on display in the museum that our visitors can come down and take a look at. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some pieces that are not on display. And we'll begin with this amazing photograph. And let's look at this together. I mean, we're looking at a woman, obviously. She appears to be African-American. Um, she is sitting in this incredibly busy environment. We can see there's that very, very ornate wallpaper in the background with the design on it. When we look, we can see, let's see, there's one, two, there's at least three paintings on the wall. So obviously this woman is into art. If we look down in the bottom left-hand corner, we can see there's a little table there. And look, it's covered with some kind of a lace tablecloth or a doily, obviously very, very nice. There's a plant on the table. It's been cultivated. It's taken care of. Obviously, this is a very, very well-appointed little cozy parlor room of some kind. And now look at the subject herself. Look at the details. Look at the lace on her dress. Uh, she seems to be wearing maybe a little cape made of lace, but then the pattern is continued down in her skirt. She is perfectly coiffed. She has flowers in her hair. If we look at her arms, we can see that she's wearing white gloves and she is very intently reading something. Doesn't seem to be a book. Um, perhaps it's sheet music or it might be a playbill or something. But we are looking at a woman, obviously upper class, obviously well put together, and obviously very, very well appointed in an upper middle class room. So who are we looking at? Well, we're looking at cousin Susie Porter. And this is a photograph that was taken by an African-American photographer whose name was James Vanderzee. And Vanderzee was arguably the best known and most famous photographer of his generation. Um, and he was known for documenting the life of um, upwardly mobile African-Americans in Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance. And as for Vanderzee, uh, he himself was born in Massachusetts. And when he was 14 years old, he won a contest for selling soap. And his prize was an $8 box camera. And that's what started him on his career. And at first he had a hobby. He took pictures of his friends and relatives in Massachusetts, but it soon became more than that. And uh, he was born in the um, 1890s. And in about 1910 or so, when he was in his early 20s, Vanderzee moved to Harlem, New York City for good. And he was able to get a job over in Newark, New Jersey at Haynes Department Store. 
Haynes Department Store was a small family department store, and they had a photography studio set up where they would take family photos for people. And Van Der Zee became the darkroom man, and he became expert at setting up photo montages and then refinishing the pieces. Well, he was so successful that in 1916, he opened up his own studio on 135th Street, right in the heart of Harlem. And he filled his studio with these sort of props that we see in this photograph here. Uh, settee pieces, parlor pieces, artwork, plants, everything to allow his subjects to arrange themselves any way that they wanted to, to show themselves the way they wanted to um, be seen. And um, Ian, if we take a look at the next photograph, please. Okay, uh, Van Der Zee also filled his studio with all sorts of theatrical props and drapes and um, luxurious backgrounds. And here we see another photograph. He took this, um, he'd been open about eight years when he took this photograph. And look at how this young woman is just looking out at us with such confidence. She has her hand on her hip. She has her head held high, accentuating that lovely long neck. I mean, just look at what she's wearing too. She seems to be wearing some kind of a metallic breastplate. Um, it, it looks like maybe those are chains of, of beaded uh, metallic beads that are just draping down around her, almost like armor. She's got a cape on. Is she a queen? Is she an Amazon? She's wearing that headpiece that's so typical of the 1920s, down over her bangs with, with the long drape. And then look at those feathers. Look at those feathers on top of her head. She is just presenting herself to us as, as a queen, as the way she wanted to be seen by the world. And Van der Zee did not only take these types of studio photographs. Um, he was also did a lot of commissioned work. He was uh, kind of the, uh, well, he was the commissioned photographer that photographed the annual Marcus Garvey parade every year in Harlem. Uh, several important members of the um, Harlem Renaissance, people like W.E.B. Du Bois used to commission him uh, for important, uh, well, everything from celebrity weddings to important proclamations. So he was very, very busy. But his heart and soul was in his studio, and it's estimated that he took between 25,000 and 35,000 of these types of photographs during his career. Ian, we have another one I'd like to share. This comes from even later in his career. And here Van Der Zee seems to have entered into maybe even another stage. Look at the elegant simplicity of this photo. We see again, this very, very elegant, sophisticated, serene woman gazing out at us. She's just wearing that really simple little slip dress with some jewelry. Really the only accent is the suggestion of that flower pot and those flowers over there. And we just kind of see, you know, Van Der Zee at yet another stage in his career. And Ian, if we can go to the next slide, please. I put all three of them together so you can kind of see the progression of his slides. Well, Van Der Zee stayed right there in Harlem, 135th Street, until 1968. And by that time, cameras were so inexpensive and so popular that there really wasn't that much need for a studio anymore. So Van Der Zee shut down. One year later, 1969, the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art put on a what was then controversial exhibition called Harlem on My Mind and included several, several of Van Der Zee's photographs such as these. Um, Van Der Zee himself was pretty much done with the photography scene. He um, continued to live in Harlem, and then in 1983, he was invited to Washington, D.C., for to Howard University, actually, to receive um, an honorary degree. And while he was there, he passed away of a heart attack. But luckily, the Metropolitan Museum of Art did save all of his photographs. And as I said, these are not on display. Deb, as you know, photography is so delicate. It is so susceptible to light, to light and other things. So I'm glad we were able to share these with you today. And if I may, I'd like to end this presentation with a quote. Um, this comes from the National Museum of American Art in Washington, DC. It's a brochure that they have in the African-American Art 19th and 20th Century um, Gallery. 
And this was written by an individual whose name is Linda Roscoe Hardigan. And about James Vanderzee, this is what she had to say. Vanderzee strove to capture the personality, character, and intrinsic beauty of his sitters. His photographs are not simply documents, but celebrations of Harlem lives that included some degree of affluence and an appreciation for small luxuries, a beaded dress, a fur stole, an attentively decorated home. Here was an opportunity for African-Americans to see themselves as the center of a universe, as white Americans could in mainstream society. For Vanderzee, this was reflected in the careful framing of a world of elegance, refinement, and a beauty sometimes elusive in the world outside his studio. So with that, Christine, do we have any questions? We actually don't, but uh, we sure are lucky at the DIA, aren't we, to have such a nice collection of photographs yeah. and, uh, and being photographs and having to stay, you know, resting in the dark. I've actually never seen any of these. I know. Have you? Aren't they amazing? Aren't they amazing? I know. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I haven't would... seen them, but they are amazing. They're beautiful. Yeah. Well, Deb, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I think you've got a Picasso for us, don't you? That's right. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about this work, and it's another work on paper. We're staying with these works on paper. And this is called Bather by the Sea, Dora Mar, and it's by Pablo Picasso. Henriette Theodora Markovich, known as Dora Mar, was a French photographer, a painter, and a poet. She was an artist who lived for almost all of the 20th century. Mara was born in, two, in uh, 1907. She was raised between Argentina and France. She was educated and well-traveled and spoke fluid French and Spanish. Supported by her family, she was able to pursue a career in the arts. In Paris, she took courses at the Central Union of Decorative Arts and also enrolled at Ecole des Beaux-Arts to learn painting. Although she studied painting, she decided to become a commercial photographer. She quickly became a name for herself, taking fashion and advertising commissions, but she was also a street photographer and felt driven to observe the most disadvantaged members of society. Mar, in, 1990s, in 1933, Mar became involved with the circle of writers and artists called the Surrealists and was one of the few women to be included in their exhibitions. She became close to this group because of her shared left-wing politics at a time of social unrest in France. It was in 1935 in Paris when, at the Café de Du Margot, she met Pablo Picasso. She was 28 years old and at the height of her career, and he was emerging from the worst time of his life at age 54. He had not sculpted or painted for months. She soon became his companion and muse. Their relationship had a huge impact on both of their careers. Mar documented the creation of Picasso's most political work, Guernica, in 1937, and she educated Picasso in photography. Their liaison lasted for nearly nine years. During this, during this uh, period, Picasso would portray Mar again and again, many times, using his new style of art called Cubism. If you could see this next slide, you will see that, we, that this is also in the DIA. It's on the second floor in the Picasso Gallery, and it's a portrait of Dora Mar called Girl Reading. Take a look at her. She's sitting at a table. She's reading a book, and Picasso's name's on that book. She, he would always portray her with thick, dark eyebrows, her striking hands, and her long red nails that she was known for. They were her attributes, plus she wore a lot of red lipstick. Many times he would depict her as a tortured, anguished woman. He would refer to Mar as his weeping woman. There might have been two reasons for this. First, Mar could not have any children. Also, he considered Dora to be a living depiction of the pain and suffering that the people of Spain experienced during the Spanish Civil War in the aftermath of Guernica. 
Picasso made a series of paintings during the Spanish Civil War, and in 1937, he created an iconic portrait of Marr that is called The Weeping Woman, and it's housed in the collection at the Tate Modern in London. It's one of his greatest and most famous works. And now for the next slide. <clears throat> Starting in uh, 1918, Picasso spent all his summers at the beach in the south of France. These journeys inspired him to create works on the theme of bathers. In 1939, while they were having a holiday on the French Riviera, Picasso made this Cubist portrait of Mar called Bather by the Sea. This image is a go wash. It's an opaque watercolor on laid paper from our prints and drawings collection. Here, Dora sits on a rock and holds a hat and a long veil on her head to protect herself from the sun. We can see Mars' thick eyebrows and look at the teeny small little red nail that you can see that on her raised left hand, on her ring finger. Both her face and her torso are drawn in simultaneous frontal and profile views. That's a device frequently seen in his portraits between 1938 and 1940. Mar and Picasso had a very turbulent relationship that came to an end in 1943. Picasso bought her a house where she lived alone, but they saw each other sporadically until 1946. When asked about Picasso's portraits of her, Mar said, and I quote, all portraits of me are lies. They're Picasso's. Not one is Dora Marr. It was from this painful separation from Picasso that Dora Marr truly became a painter in her own right, and she made many works that went unrecognized because they never left her studio. And now for the next slide. Here is a photograph of Dora Marr. She died on July 16, 1997, at 89 years old. Throughout her life, she created a vast and varied amount of work, much of which was discovered only after her death. Christine, are there any questions? Well, there was some empathy for her situation, that's for sure. You know, the poor lady had to live through uh, Picasso's um, <laughs> tumultuous life. He called her the weeping woman, and I said, if I lived with him, I'd be weeping too. Yeah. Oh, goodness. So, so would I. I'm right there with you, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but, but there she is. You can see her dark eyebrows. You can see her red nails and her red lipstick. She was a stunning woman as well. And what a story she had. So now, Kathleen, you're going to show us some images of another stun stunning woman, She's well known and she's beloved. Absolutely, thank you, Deb. Um, talk about some, you know, women of substance here. I think most people in our audience will readily recognize this woman. She is arguably one of the most photographed women of the 20th century. This, of course, is the iconic Mexican artist Frida Kahlo. And here we see her in a um, close-up portrait that was taken by the American photographer Bernard G. Silverstein in 1940 at Frida Kahlo's home in Mexico, which she shared with her husband, of course, Diego Rivera. And in this photograph, we see all of Frida Kahlo's talents of self-promotion and self-creation on display. Um, Frida Kahlo, her parents, um, her father was a German immigrant, and he had been um, a professional photographer. And as a child, Frida Kahlo spent a lot of time in the dark room and in the studio with her father. And she learned about the importance and the uh, ability to use photography as a you know, form of self-promotion. And uh, so here we see her pose just so. She has her hair done up in a traditional Mexican style. Um, we see her um, very well-known, very dark eyebrows, her unibrow. In fact, I just, I just noticed my coffee cup. Um, we can see the little bit of facial hair here. These, of course, were nods to uh, Frida's mother, who was of indigenous heritage. Um, we see that Frida is wearing, Frida Kahlo is wearing these long dangling silver earrings, a celebration of Mexican arts and crafts. Even though this is a black and white photograph, 
we can imagine the colors of that, that scarf that she's wearing. We can just imagine it and the bright traditional, the red, the green on the white background of the traditional um, Mexican arts and crafts movement. And of course, on her hand there, she's wearing not one, not two, but three more silver rings, again, showing off the art of Mexico, the craft of Mexico, her pride in her homeland, and again, nods to her mother's indigenous heritage. So who was this photographer and how did he get access to Frida Kahlo? Well, Silverstein was born um, in Ohio in 1905. He actually attended the University of Michigan and he got a degree in electrical engineering. But like many young men, he was given a camera as a gift in his late teens. And soon his passion for photography overcame his electrical engineering background. So he quit his career in electrical engineering and he became um, a photographer who was known for his portraits. And he achieved international success pretty quickly. Uh, he traveled all over the world. He had commissions from publications such as National Geographic, uh, Esquire magazine, the New York Times, Look magazine, Life magazine. And right after a photography session um, with the King of Morocco, Silverstein was given an assignment to go down and capture the Mexican muralist scene. And uh, so of course he found himself at the home of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in 1940. And if we can take a look at the next photograph, please, Ian, here we see another photograph that came out of that exact same session. And if you look closely, it's very possible that Frida is wearing the same outfit that she was wearing in the previous um, close up portrait of her. And while this may appear to be a candid scene, you better believe that Frida Kahlo had absolutely set up this. This, this is not a candid shot. I mean, she has her husband, Diego Rivera, over there on the right, you know, in his very traditional kind of bulky serge suit, looking down as her at, as she is perched and apparently putting the finishing touches on a self-portrait that she is painting of herself. So we kind of have this three-way portrait going on here. And in the portrait, we see that Frida is painting herself as a tahuna. Now, a tahuna was part of a matriarchal society up in northern um, Mexico. And neither Frida nor her mother had anything to do with the tahunas personally, but Frida collected indigenous and native um, Mexican uh, outfits, and she wore them all the time. And at all of her entire collection, the tahuna, which you can see here, is wearing that very elaborate starched headdress that encircles her face, kind of like a sunflower. This was her very favorite. If we continue to look at the photograph in the background, you can see there's another one of Frida's very large paintings called The Last Supper. And uh, as I said, we just kind of see the artist at work and we get this, this kind of triple portrait. Ian, if you can advance the slide now, um, this is what the actual, the, the image on the left, obviously, is what the finished painting looked like. And when we look at the photograph on the right, we can see that it was not, it was still a work in progress. When we look at the painting itself, we see that Frida added the flowers up on the crown of her head and she also added another image of Diego on her forehead, looking out at us to give us the name of this painting, Diego on my mind, self-portrait of a tahuna. Okay. Um, Ian, one more photograph, please. And yet we have another pose shot that Frida put together. There she is in complete kahuna outfit from the headdress all the way down to the long skirt with the apron over it. And again, she has artfully composed herself in front of racks and racks, leaving on the floor, all of example of, of again, um, Mexican artistry work by Mexican artists, by indigenous artists, um, pieces of art that evoke the history and, and the background of the indigenous population, population of Mexico. So here we have just these three photographs, again, not on display. We are so lucky to have these in our collection. And what happened to Silverstein? Well, he continues his career after this photo shoot. And um, he taught photography at the University of Cincinnati for a long time. And on a side note, he had one of the very first long running regular television shows um, in Cincinnati. It was Channel 5 and it was a weekly show on photography tips. 
Um, and despite this long career, Silver Sun's session with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivero really obviously became kind of the defining um, aspect of his work. And these um, images that the DIA owns have been re reproduced across the world internationally. You can see them in books, you can see them on photo albums, you can see them on album covers, advertisements, textbooks, they're just about everywhere. And uh, Ian, if we go to the final slide, there we go. Um, just this wonderful collection that the DIA is very lucky to own and that we're lucky to share with you today. Um, Christine, do we have any questions about this, please? No specific questions, but uh, are, you know, aren't we lucky to have a um, a few photographs that really highlight uh, her her painting for one, and also how she really enjoyed uh, showing her personal identity and expressing herself and in in, uh, in indigenous clothing of Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. So it, there's some really nice connections here. Yeah. They're beautiful. She, she created a public persona. This is how she chose to be portrayed, and she did a superb job at achieving it. So. She did. And, and uh, you know, today, I don't know. I wonder what she would have thought about being so famous. I know. I know. I know. But, uh, Deb, I'm going to turn it back over to you. We're getting short on time here, so let's keep moving. So. Let's keep moving, and we're still staying in photography. We're going to talk about this picture called The Woman with Gloves Smoking. And it's by the master lensman, Bill Rohauser, who was an American photographer and educator. Rohauser was born in Detroit and documented the city from the 1940s. He received a bachelor's degree in engineering in 1943, and he spent 25 years in that field. He bought his first camera in 1933 for 39 cents, and he wanted to use it as a hobby. But what began as a hobby turned into a lifelong passion. In 1951, acclaimed photographer Edward Steichen came to the DIA to speak about photography and to promote his upcoming exhibition that called The Family of Man at the MoMA in New York City. He invited photographers in the audience to submit their work to him. And he said, I'm going to choose several of these. I'm going to include those photographs of yours in this exhibition. Rose, ha Rose Rohauser submitted a photo called Three on a Bench, Detroit River. And guess what? It was chosen for the exhibition. This exhibition became one of the most successful and viewed photo exhibits in history. After it left the MoMA, it traveled the world and it was seen by over 9 million people. This recognition prompted Rohauser to devote himself full time to photography. Bill Rohauser took photographs of everyday life and of the people in De on De of Detroit on the streets, at the carnival, at the fairs, and at his beloved Detroit Institute of Arts, where he would spend time enjoying our art collection and photographing individuals in the galleries and in other public spaces like Kresge Court. Rohauser worked on in-depth thematic series throughout his, year, his career, and one in particular focused on women smoking. He had an eye for female beauty, and in 1964, he captured in black and white the smoky-eyed temptress in pearls, overcoat and an overcoat draped around her shoulders and here she is with gloves on smoking she's contemplatively nursing her cigarette right there at the table and if you see farther down the table there's a hand of a man maybe he's smoking as well this photo untitled woman with gloves smoking it's a scene that most detroiters of a certain age might be able to identify with in 1970, he was hired as a faculty member at the Center for Creative Studies. He taught there for more than 30 years. This particular picture, Woman with Glove Smoking, is a part of his unprecedented archive of more than 10,000 images made throughout Detroit from the 1950s through the late 1970s. 
Bill Rohlhauser has been called the Dean of Detroit Photography. And in 2014, he received the title of Kresge Eminent Artist from the DIA. Three years later, in 2017, he died at age 99, just two weeks before his 100th birthday. Yeah. Now, Kathleen, can you relate to this at all? Oh, Deb, been there, done that. Are, yep. we, are we giving away our secrets like our age and the oh. fact that we used to smoke? But I did go there and smoke when they did not have a um, ceiling over oh, open air. Yeah. Open air. And yeah. you know what? This is funny, too. We look at this and we admire it, but now we're docents. So we go into Rivera Court and we talk to our visitors about Rivera Court. And sometimes we mention that people could smoke at the DIA and they could even smoke in Rivera Court. Could we see the next slide? Take a look at her. Bill Rohlhauser captured her at the same year when he was doing this series on women smoking. There she is, this lady, sitting on some couch in Rivera Court. And look, she pulled up that, that cylinder ashtray so she could read and smoke. I, I can't believe it. I've never seen anything like it. But there it is. It's proof. People did do that. <laughs> Christine, are there any questions? Are you showing us a little blast from the past? Blast from the past and you know, our vices. <laughs> Well, oh, I love those photographs, Deb. Thanks I so much for sharing them. Too. I just love those. Now, and, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say we're going to move on to our last piece today, unfortunately. And it is this magnificent painting. And this is one of those paintings that this slide just doesn't even begin to do it justice. In this slide, we see all of the attributes of the Africobra movement. And we see it's woman supreme. We see a woman, she's gazing out at us. And while it's obvious, you can see the bright neon Kool-Aid colors. You can see all the lines of text and letters. There are words there. You can see there's woman supreme, there is black, it's beautiful. What we're missing um, in that the original artwork is that there are all sorts of tones of, of gold foil in there. Um, that don't that don't come through in this photograph, and it just it just makes this painting riveting when you walk by this. This was on display in a special exhibition, and people would literally just stop dead in their tracks to look at this. And so I said it has all the attributes of Africobra. So what is Africobra? Well, Africobra stands for the African Commune of Bad relevant artists. And this was a movement that was started by a number of young African-American artists on the south side of Chicago in 1968. And one of the founders of this group was Wadsworth Durrell, who is the artist who painted this incredible um, painting of Woman Supreme. And Wadsworth Durrell was born in Georgia. His father had been a furniture maker and his mother was known for her quilts. And uh, Wadsworth Durrell was the youngest of six kids. And his whole family was artistic. And he always said that he had this incredibly immersive artistic um, upbringing that, that led him to a career in art. Well, right after high school, he went to Korea. After he got out of Korea, he came back. He moved to Chicago and he enrolled in the um, Art Institute of Chicago Art School. And this is where he ran into other young African-American artists among them, Gerald Williams, um, there was Barbara Jones Hogu, um, Jeff Donaldson and himself and some others. And they started this Afrocobra movement, Black Pride, but on a national, international level. Um, they wanted to create distinctive voices. They wanted to create a different uh, celebration of Black culture. Um, but it was all about the new diasporic African identity, the positive, the, the, the drumbeat, the importance of the Black culture coming along. If we can move to the next slide, please. Thanks, Ian. Here is a close-up. And again, it doesn't do it justice. But you can see, if you look at the woman's face, you can see that there's bees reported every, there's just repeated bees, 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 bees that fill in the co co um, cultures of her face 
and everything stands for B. Black is beautiful. Woman supreme. Black is beautiful. So who is this woman? Well, in um, Cincinnati, uh, there was a young woman who was growing up. Um, her name was Elaine Annette Johnson. Her father had been a professional um, um, fashion designer. Her uncle had been a haberdasher, and she and her mother loved vintage clothing. And Elaine taught herself to sew. Uh, when she was in her 20s, she too moved to Chicago. Uh, she became a student at the um, Art Institute of Chicago. And while she was there in school, she confided to her best friend that she'd always dreamed of opening up her own clothing boutique. So her friend said, well, why don't you take your name, Elizabeth Annette Johnson, and turn it around and go with the letters J-A-E. And this is what this woman did. She adopted the name J professionally, and she opened up her own clothing boutique, Jays of Hyde Park. And one day, a young art student whose name was Wadsworth Jarrell wandered into her clothing boutique, and the rest is history. They became married. And this is how we got this wonderful, wonderful portrait of Woman Supreme, Wadsworth Jarrell's tribute to his wife, Jay. And as for Jay, Ian, if we go to the next slide, please. I mean, Jay Jarrell was an incredible artist herself. Here's an example of her revolutionary suit that she designed in 1969. That's her wearing it on the left. And again, we can see it's made out of the brown serge. It was all part of the Afro-Cobra movement and the empowerment of African voices across um, the entire world. Uh, we have another example of her art on the next slide. And you can see, again, she's got the bold line. She's got the positive images of the work um, that's accentuating and celebrating Black culture. We've got Black jazz. We have artists, the letters, the call-outs. And this is called Urban Wall Suit from 1969. And I'd like to end, if we can go to the final slide, here is a photograph of the couple. And Wadsworth Jarrell was quoted as saying, in Afro-Cobra, we thought that our first project should be about the Black family. We discussed how they had all been torn apart and split. And we always wanted to complete, a com to present a complete family. And that's where we got that amazing portrait of Woman Supreme. And that brings us to the end of our presentation today on uh, Women of Substance in the DIA. Christine, do we have any um, questions or final comments? There was just one question. Um, one of the viewers asked what special exhibition that last um, painting was in. It was in a special exhibition that we mounted right uh, before the pandemic, and it was called Expressions and Experience. Thank you. Thank you. I yes. wasn't mean. Um, and it was all about um, new works of art that the museum had acquired in the last well, decade might be too long, the last five or six years that brought right. forth um, unique yeah. viewpoints that maybe hadn't been shared before. Mm -hmm. And Woman Supreme was at the end of this amazing collection full of all kinds of art. And, you know, it's at the end and people are, you know, heading towards the exit and boom, everybody was stopped dead in their tracks by that amazing, mm -hmm. amazing painting that just popped right off the wall. So. What yeah, the, the colors um, are really pretty incredible. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, so. You have a few compliments. Always grateful. Lovely uh, presentation. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Deb, as always, it's wonderful to work with you. And Christine, thanks so much. Um, I'd also like to thank our behind-the-scenes producers, Ian um, Repigny, for handling the slides for us, and, of course, Amanda Harrison. And please plan on coming back and joining us next week. Um, it'll be a special week. We're going to be playing um, Art Bingo, and Ian will be your host for that. So hopefully we'll see you all next week. And uh, for everybody else, Deb, you too, happy March is Women's History Month. That's and right. I, um, I hope you enjoyed meeting some of these incredible women today, women of substance. Power to the women. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Thank you.